Well, it's it's one o'clock and, and we'll get started. Uh, my name is Tim Pierce. Uh, I work for First Ten. I, I work on the consultation team and with, with Region Seven uh, as well as Region Five. And I appreciate everyone coming here to the room to to have a, a dialogue with us uh, of all quality service priority preemption. Also, everyone who's attending via webinar. Just a quick note uh, for for those attending by the webinar. Um, the, the panelists function we were going to look at using uh, isn't going to quite work. Uh, so if you do have questions, could you type those in the Q&A and then I'll read off those questions uh, that you submit. So still an opportunity for dialogue. It's just the, I think my iPad may not be muted. So it's making noise right now. A little echo here in the room. So, so just a note on that, but uh, thanks for everyone to be here. And, and also thanks to not only the state of Iowa, but also the Iowa Communications Network uh, for hosting us here, and, and so Rick, if uh, you just had a, a couple of words for the group, again, I appreciate your willingness to host uh, uh, here in the state for the region. Well, thank you for being involved in the FirstNet conversation, and the state of Iowa has been working on the FirstNet process for our state uh, for a better part of three years now, and, uh, and it's been quite a journey. Uh, we've tried to keep pace with everything that's gone on with FirstNet in very much discovery mode, and if there's any help you need in this in our region that we could help in any way shape or form i know every state's involved in this in in, uh, in those processes uh, we have a uh, i think a fairly effective uh, broadband committee we've been stewarding in the state now for uh, going on its second year and uh, if you guys need any help anything we or comments or you just want to appear on this whole conversation in our FEMA region uh, other things that are emerging even with 911 and things like that feel free to uh, connect with the state of Iowa and uh, we'll be more than happy to help in any way. And uh, we've appreciated the relationship with FirstNet in, in that this isn't, hasn't been your normal federal program. If any of you guys have done VTOP grants or things like that with NCIA and Department of Commerce, uh, our experience uh, with FirstNet has been one very much of a, an evolving partnership. And so we haven't experienced that in state and federal government uh, hardly at all. And so we've appreciated the fact that we're watching FirstNet grow, we're watching them make changes, and we've tried to stay as pliable in our mechanisms during that process as possible also. And so, uh, if you, if there's, again, if there's anything you can do or you need help with uh, in your state, we would be more than happy to help in the state of Iowa if we can. And uh, we're even entertaining conversations with uh, how FirstNet looks at our FEMA region in general also, uh, not just state by state, but other, other synergies that we could bring together in our FEMA region, and some of the other regions are having similar conversations to that. So again, welcome to the state of Iowa in the middle of uh, in the middle of the state right now. So welcome. Thanks so much, uh, Rick, for that. I, I appreciate that. So if I get this right, I'll go ahead. And start. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Um, so I appreciate what we'll do here in the room is I could just go around and have everyone introduce themselves and what, what state uh, that, that uh, you're up here uh, having a conversation uh, for and also what the, the discipline that you represent. Jeff Anderson, I'm representing the Iowa Emergency Management Association on the Iowa Personnel Committee. I'm Jeff Sundholm with Iowa DOT I'm the Assistant Division Director of IT. I'm Michelle Bischoff uh, with the City of Des Moines Fire Department. Brian Courtney, State of Missouri, Department of Public Safety. I'm the director of the statewide radio network and the state point of contact with FirstNet. I'm Les Thurston, I'm a lieutenant with Missouri State Highway Patrol. I'm assistant director of the IT Comp Communications Center. William McLean, I'm with the Iowa National Guard and I'm also with the Iowa FirstNet. Bob Blitzberg, I'm the uh, education and outreach coordinator for Missouri on the FirstNet project. Uh, Brian. Uh, Gary Fisher, I'm uh, Okay. Uh, Nelson Castile, Shawnee County Emergency Management, Kansas. Ellen Warnke, Johnson County, Kansas Emergency Management Communications, representing the American Regional Council. Okay. Uh, Derek Morris, Kansas Office Emergency Communications, I'm one of the public safety broadband coordinators for Kansas. Sheriff Troy Briggs, Haskell County Sheriff's Office, Kansas Sheriff's Association. Also. I'm Elliot Lane, I'm the director of Fort County Emergency. Kansas Office of Emergency Communications, Public Safety Program Coordinator. Welcome. 
Wilhelm, Nebraska's um, state local implementation grant program. Dan Shear, I'm all fired from it. Bob Howard, State of Nebraska CIO's office, top time manager. Um, uh, reading to interoperability, um, council chair and fire chief of Buffalo Center. Well, we can have our oh, we're on the Iowa Communications Network. Rick Lombard with the Iowa Communications Network. Welcome. And then we have Becky Van Ness for our support team and three others from ICN helping us out if you would. John Tell Harris from ICN. John Cave from ICN. All right, and then we have Jennifer Harder who uh, will tell us a little bit uh, more about herself in a minute. So, uh, as we talk about you know today and how this fits into the bigger picture, as many of you are I'm sure are aware that uh, the, the law that created FirstNet uh, gave us some specific directives about consulting uh, with. Uh, with states uh, on certain elements and so one of those was you know priority of, of local users and, and so that fits into the consultation task team portion that uh, you, you see uh, on the screen here in front of you in kind of that roll up the sleeves get into a little bit more dialogue about uh, how, how from an operational perspective what this would look like and so that's what we're looking to have a conversation with you all today is from a deployment standpoint how should this network <coughs> function and operate? And, and Jennifer will talk much more into in to depth on that. So, so what will happen then is as a result of the engagement here today, uh, the other regions that have been conducted, and then if any states wish to do a state-specific engagement regarding this topic, we'll, we'll take that feedback and roll that into a, a report that will be a distributed plan to be at the November SPOC meeting. And so taking all the different feedback that we've gotten from the states and regions into how that network deployment is going to come about. So with that, I will uh, hand this over to Jennifer, and she'll take us through uh, our dialogue today. Thank you. So my name is Jennifer Harder, and I'm with FirstNet Chief Technologist Office, Technology Office out of Boulder, Colorado. I'm a technology planning and development kind of gal. And for whatever reason, on a highly technical topic that is QPP, they sent you all a psychologist not an engineer. <laughs> There's a reason. As we go through today, you're going to discover what we're doing is taking a very technical topic and talking about it operationally. What is this going to look like to public safety? What is it going to feel like? What is it going to do to enable their operations and how they're able to get the job done? So that's the big transition and focus that I'm going to ask you guys to participate in today is to help us to translate A to B and to make sure that this looks appropriate in the field and it works the way that we want it to. Yeah. Kind of how the day is going to go. To give you a sense of the process, how many of you did all the read ahead materials that were handed out in advance? Watched the lovely videos on YouTube, opted away from the Olympics, skipped Michael Phelps, I watched out for the diving last night, instead watched lovely videos. If you haven't for any reason, hold your nose, big dive. It's a lot of content and material that we're going to go through, but everything that you watched and read in the white paper and on those two videos we're going to go through today. And I'm going to step you through the different pieces and parts of it. Okay? I'm out of camera range on purpose. All right. <laughs> hey, Kim. As we go through it, a couple things that I want everyone to keep in mind. First and foremost, like I said, this is going to be an operational discussion. So for those of you who are very technically focused, and I know who you are in your heart, and you want to go diving to the depths of the ocean technically and bring us into all of these great acronyms and down to the bottom. You can scuba dive down there if you wish, but all of us operational people are going to be snorkeling above you. I will pull you back up. Help me to translate what you're giving me technically into something that I can use for policy. Okay? FirstNet has not written QPP policy yet. We're here to consult with you on what that policy should include. So quite literally, the policy has not been written or created. The framework that you read was a concept. It was CTO's concept in, in uh, conglomeration in conjunction with the PSAC, Public Safety Advisory Commission, working together to come up with what they thought QPP might look like and how it might work and what we might need from it. 
We need to take that conceptual framework and apply policy to it, and we need your input to do that. So every time you give me a good technical idea, I'm going to say translate it for me. How would you put that in policy? Further, I'm going to ask you guys as we go along today, does that sound like nationwide policy? Something that should be consistent across the network? Or does that sound like something that can have local change to it? Something that perhaps a locality could put in their policies for how they use various different broadband applications without negatively affecting the nationwide experience. And there's going to be opportunities for both. So we need to figure out what should be ubiquitous across this network, much like your experience today with any commercial carrier. You get on the plane in Poughkeepsie, you get off the plane in Des Moines, and the thing works the same way. What should that be? And what could be locally influenceable? What can we adjust to make operations work for us in the various localities across the nation better without messing each other up? Okay, so where can we see those different dividing lines? I'll be asking you a lot of that. When it comes to design of the network, how this thing will be built, the ship has sailed. We put out an RFP, an objectives-based RFP, asking for industry to come back and give us their best innovative solutions to the problem. They have, in fact, done that and produced their innovative solutions and submitted those solutions. That is under evaluation, and there's not a darn thing we can do about it. Furthermore, I can't talk about it. So if you have questions about the procurement, questions about the RFP, questions about the design or the proposals, the contracting officer's name is up on the screen, Greg Rudeman. There's his email address. He can speak to it. I cannot. And it's why, when it comes to, I think we should technically design it this way, it's done. There's nothing we can do about that. We can decide how to use it. Okay? We can decide what the policy looks like for how it's going to function. And that's where we're at today. Okay? Questions on that? So that you all know going into this what the go forward is, there's three basic ways we're going to get data out of this effort. All of these CTTs are happening in all the different regions in the country. You guys are eight of, no, nine of 10 on the regions. So as of next week, the regional CTTs will be complete. All of the conversation that takes place during this next couple hours, Becky's capturing for us. And that is becoming a primary data source for us going back to our engineers and our CCO personnel as we write this policy. We're gonna go sit with them and say, okay, as you guys are coming up with how to do this, this is the input from across the nation. These are the trends that we see, where most people thought this was how we should go. These are the outliers that we saw, some really great one-off ideas that came from folks. What do we think about that? Bringing all that information together. Okay, and that's data source one. Number two, at the end of this presentation, there's gonna be a link to an online feedback form. And I'm gonna ask everybody here to please go and fill that in. It has four basic questions. What is it about QPP that you think is the strongest value proposition? What is it that's the best thing about this for first responders and for public safety? Number two, what are you still concerned about? What piece of this are we still not getting? It's still worrisome. It's not coming together right in your mind. You're not sure you like it yet. Number three, what part of it do you understand most completely? Makes the most sense, has been best explained, it's really resonating. And number four, what do you still have questions about? What doesn't make sense? What isn't sitting? What isn't sticking? Okay. The data from those things, generally speaking, will tell us there's about 20% of this thing that's given us 80% of our heartburn. We got to figure out where those bands are and make sure the policy feels those out. So that's our second big input. If any of you choose to take this material back out to your states or to other people who weren't here today and ask them for more inputs, if they give you any, please send them to us. That's our third source. So if you take it back and if you outreach guys and you get other ideas from folks, we'd love to hear it. Please, by all means, send it to Tim. He'll get it to us and we'll use that as well. So it's not just restricted necessarily to who's here. If you have other great people that you want to incorporate into the process, please do. All that data goes to our engineers and our CCO team and we sit and policy comes out. And if we do it right, you'll be able to see fingerprints. Here's exactly where that input made sense and where it fit in. Okay. Questions on that? Yes. Uh, general question. Do you know how many folks are watching this via webinar and 
Can they interact? They can, and they absolutely will. And she can see them when they flag up, and it says, hello, I'd like a question asked. Um, so if anyone on the phone, for example, can't hear me at any time, if you're getting feedback, if you're getting challenges, please tap your little button. I think you can type in a text, and she'll open the, the block up for you, and you can speak out. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm following as well. Great. Tim can see it. For those of you who are on the phone and for those of you who are in the room, unless you want us all to laugh hysterically at your Metallica ringtone, I would suggest turning all your phones to vibrate. That way none of us get disrupted. There are bathrooms straight out here to the right and to the left. It's a little convoluted, but it's also a small building, so you'll get there. Just keep going down that hallway till it dead ends. Any of you who smoke, tragically not here. Apparently the entire campus is smoke-free, so please don't go outside um, and, and do that because we will get in trouble. Their logistics. All right, in we go. Okay. First thing I want to do is run through some definitions just to make sure that as I use these terms for the rest of the day, we all understand what I mean when I say it. Okay. So all this comes out of the white paper, pretty straightforward, but I just want to make sure we're all tuned up into what the ridiculous amount of terminology is for this particular topic. So starting off, we know we have primary users and secondary users, right? Primary users would be public safety entities, as defined under the Act. Secondary users are the rest of the world who can use the spectrum on a CLA basis, okay, basically a leasing agreement basis, on a millisecond by millisecond basis, so long as we're not using it. They get the excess we're not using. Not on an incident basis, not on a operational period basis, on a millisecond by millisecond basis. Okay, they're using the excess at the speed of math. Those two groups of people can exist each in three different states according to the framework that you read, okay, this concept. Primary users have three different ways basically to elevate their priority. They have immediate peril, loosely translated into somebody's gonna die. They have emergency responder emergency. It's going to be the responder. That's your traditional man down button. I'm in big trouble, help me. And then a relayed user, whereby we could elevate the priority of the person standing here because they're the conduit that lets them over there go through them to access the network. So this person becomes critically important. That's three ways we can elevate a primary user above and beyond what they normally have. Secondary users also exist in three states. For those of you who remember the, the white paper, it's the chickens and the bunnies. Free range, they can use as much of the spectrum as they want that we're not using. Restricted, we say only this much of the spectrum can you roam about in. You can't actually go in this last piece. And preempted in this definition means you are off band 14. Preempted is a toughie, but that's basically what it means in this definition. You are gone. You are back home. You are somewhere else, but you're not in here with us. You're not working the same spectrum we're working. The three big definitions for the day, for the Q, the P, and the P. Quality of service is the feature of the network that makes sure that public safety users have access to what they need when they need it. Okay. Way to think about quality of service, fun we talked a little bit about it the other day, it's basically invisibility. I grab my device, I do what my device needs to do, and it does it. I don't have to think about it. It doesn't hiccup, it doesn't blurp, it doesn't go into that ridiculous spinning mode while I'm trying to get my video. I grab my device, I ask it to do something, it does it. Quality of service. Okay. Priority, we are ahead of others. We have access to resources before they do. Okay. It's that network feature that allows various users, potentially, devices, potentially, applications, potentially, data sources or packets, potentially, to be elevated above others. To give you an example, Dallas shooting, how many weeks ago? That bomb robot, that device better be elevated above everything else. Not necessarily the guy driving it, could be three different guys capable of driving it, right? But the device needed to be on top for what it was trying to do. So we could have that type of thing for priority, okay? Preemption is the network feature that lets you control resource use by taking away an active session and giving it to someone else. So it's not just access to the network or access to resources. You already have the resource and I'm taking it from you and I'm giving it to someone else. It could be ruthless. I kick you off. I can literally, you're gone. I take all the resources from you. Or it could be various other ways to preempt a user. For example, you throttle them, you slow them down, 
you hiccup them for a second, you delay them, you send that text and it says searching, sending, sent. Yeah, that, that's preemption. You got a resource slightly pulled back so someone else could have a faster response time potentially. Most of the time, they won't notice it. It's that type of thing. Ruthless preemption is when it's off the network. Okay. Couple other definitions. A QPP profile, when I say profile, I simply mean how the network knows who you are or what you're holding. How the network knows what this device is or isn't. Okay. It's that list of attributes that tell the network what that entity is supposed to have access to, okay, be it an application profile, be it a human profile, any of those different things. Triggers or thresholds, those are ways to kick us between the various network states. So if I need to pull us from the static state to the dynamic state, there's a trigger that moves me there or a threshold of, of loading. I get up to this, and then it rolls me in there. And there's various ways to move, and we're going to talk about all of those. Okay. The three different network states that can move us between static, dynamic, controlled. We're going to go through all these in depth, but functionally, simply enough, static is the state where the network operates based on data it already knows. You taught it who you are when you got the device, and it uses that information to do its job. It learns nothing new. Dynamic, it is capable of learning new data. When you handed it the device, it did not know what incident you were operating on. In dynamic, you can tell it, I'm on this fire. Okay, so it can learn something new. Control is when the network cannot solve its loading problems by math and algorithm, and a human has to intervene functionally to hit control, alt, delete, and reboot the darn thing. Okay? That's basically what controlled means. Controlled is like bringing a sledgehammer to a surgery suite. It's not ideal, we don't want to do it, but if the network can't undo itself, we can go in there and <clears throat> reshuffle the deck, slide back out. So that's the controlled state. Okay, so the three network states, and again, I'll go through all these individually, but that was that layer cake looking diagram. One more <laughs> set of definitions. Okay. The dynamic controller it's that network element sits at the core. It's a concept element. You can't go buy it today. It does not exist. It's working its way through standards now. But basically, it's the widget that we get to put dynamic data into, and it helps to make better decisions in the network. So when I talk about local control or local influence of the network, I mean local control or influence of that widget, of the dynamic controller. It's how I can Seattle can tell it what I want in this sector without influencing what happens in Poughkeepsie, right? That's that dynamic controller bit. Again, you can't go buy one. They don't exist today. It's being developed. Okay. Incident data types, it's the type of data that the network is capable of learning. And we're going to talk a lot about this because we want to make sure that we conceptualize of all the things that you might want to teach it on a given basis. So it's all the things it could learn, like where this incident is taking place, the incident severity, user role. Maybe today you're a patrol officer, and tomorrow you're the incident commander. Does it need to know that? Okay, those types of things. There's the big one. Governance of QPP. Different conceptually than governance of LMR. Okay? The idea here is relationships. How do we need to relate to one another and coordinate with one another in order to make things like priority work well? For example, let's say we have a sheriff's department who decides to give priority to their deputies based on rank. And they have lieutenant as one of their ranks. And the nearby police department also gives rank, but they don't have lieutenants, they have sergeants and captains. How does that translate? Does the network know what that means? Okay. It's the relationships among us to help make these profiles work and make sense. You're not governing something. We're not dictating the ownership of an object. We're dictating the relationships amongst the users. 
Okay, it's a little different. Finally, the big nasty one that everyone gets all worked up about is local control. Local control is the toughie. If nothing else happens today, what I'd love you guys to come away with is the sense that local control is a verb, not a noun. It is a methodology, it is a way, it is a series of actions that you can take to influence how well this network supports you. It is not a big red button. It's not gonna walk away, we're all gonna walk and, and you're gonna go into the first net shop and I'm gonna hand you a switch. You're gonna be able to throw it when you want, okay? The best explanation for this I have is let's all imagine we have a big ugly incident go down and the fire chief hits the big red button and gets all the resources they could possibly want. Why would they ever let go of the big red button? Right? So we don't want that. We want a way for us to help the network make better decisions without stripping resources from each other or causing unintended consequences, liability, all sorts of dangerous things. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that particular one at the end. And I know that's everybody's big, big concern. So far I can tell you, since you guys are nine out of, of 10 on the regions, that one is top of the, we're still concerned about this, peak. Okay, so local control still has some issues. But that's the last one that's coming out. Any questions on definitions? All of this is gonna come up later, but I wanna make sure everyone understands what those are. Okay, and now I get to stop talking, y'all get to start talking. All right, so just to start everybody off, to make sure for those of you guys who have not been indoctrinated into the Fun First Net over the last couple of years, how the network is conceived overall, what the general idea of it is. Today, you have commercial nationwide networks that operate across the country, and they basically operate in something that looks like this. You have cores distributed, they're connected by backhaul out to the tower sites that we all see and that functionally makes up the RAN, the radio access network. Your device goes through the air wirelessly to the RAN, and that's how you connect up to the tower into the overall network that's going on. Today, public safety and the public are equivalent. The network has no way of knowing who's who. It's not told that. It's told to recognize that device because that device was purchased on my spectrum. And so it sees your Sprint device and it connects you up. Okay, so that's how it works. So public safety and the public are the same. FirstNet going forward adds band 14 spectrum. It adds a new thing. Right now, if we have congestion at a specific site, public safety and the public can equally experience that congestion. They can be preempted. They can lose access to resources. There's all sorts of consequences that can happen equivalently. But with our spectrum coming in, we can add additional capacity through that spectrum. So one thing that's considered in our network would be co-located sites. <clears throat> Simply enough, it's a lot easier to hang an antenna on something that exists than to build a new tower. Building a new tower is not fun. Anyone tried to do it? It's really hard. All sorts of environmental things and everything else going along. So if we could, it'd be great to just hang a new antenna, which would give us co-located sites. The same site that's radiating, let's say, T-Mobile today could be radiating us tomorrow. You'd have co-equivalent sites. Technically, yep, there could be some slightly different sizing on how those sectors work, depending on how high the antenna is, but conceptually, you would have the same coverage that you had today. Simply two different bands on that coverage. The nice thing about FirstNet, we also have the opportunity to have FirstNet only sites. If there is a location in the country where we have a strong public safety operational need, we go out there a lot. We need to be using this spectrum there a lot. But there's no real reason that the commercial sector would monetize that location. Not enough people out there to make money off of it. They haven't put a site out there. But we could. We could say, nope, that's a critical location. States have identified to us that spot matters tremendously. We could have single sites that only radiate first net. Okay, they do not radiate the others. The other inclusions, we've got public safety spread around, is by doing it this model, we move just like you guys use today. LMR, your radio only works within the coverage footprint of your radio system. You go outside the coverage footprint of your radio system, it doesn't work. The new network for LTE, you can take your device just like you do on a nationwide network today, 
from site to site across the country, from co-located to first net only, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, you can move around the same way we do with our normal phones today. We also have the potential in public safety to move to areas where there is no coverage, and frankly, there never will be. And we all need to kind of accept there's parts of this country that will never have LTE terrestrial coverage. Nobody wants to put a tower on Half Dome. Pretty simple. We're not putting one on Kilauea. These are not things that are going to happen. So if we're going to operate there, we still need to have access to a network, and we have the, pot the potential to bring in deployable and satellite backhaul solutions. So we have the option of temporarily covering a spot, allowing us to execute an operation, and then that coverage goes away. Okay, it's some of the things that they've, they've proposed and considered in the RFP, for example, when it went out to, to bidders was, how would you do, I think it's called a VNS solution, a vehicular solution where it's a modem mounted in the car. And as I drive along, I take the network with me. Okay, so I can go out to these more remote locations that we operate in, but there's no terrestrial coverage there. Okay, so that option exists within the FirstNet concept. Now let's take this particular location here. If we're using Spectrum, we're going to be using various different amounts of it, doing different things, accessing videos, downloading documents, uploading voice, sorts of mapping, that type of thing. If we have a whole lot of folks out there, they're sharing that Spectrum with us. So public safety is using some of it, CLA users are using other components of it, and everyone is working within the Spectrum that we have available to us. If something were to go on and it were to load up, Okay, we've used up all the spectrum. We don't have enough left, enough resources left. We have access to it, and we take it. Now, this picture shows ruthless preemption. All right, we've gotten rid of the secondary users. More likely, they've been throttled, they've been adjusted, something has happened to them, but we get first access to the spectrum before they get it. Okay? And again, millisecond by millisecond basis. If the engineers are correct in the way they've explained it to me, this network can make between 1.2 and 1.6 million decisions a second. It can make that choice 1.6 million times a second. So it's constantly evaluating resources and allocating them as necessary way faster than we can conceive of. We probably will never know when this happens. You'll never see it. You'll never experience it. Somebody will just have whatever momentary blip on their radar they never noticed. Okay, and off they go. If it's horrible, truly bad, really problematic, they could get ruthlessly preempted, in which case, where do they go? Back to their home network. Right? So they go back to whomever the carrier partner is. So they're back to their experience today. They simply are back to what they already have. Okay, they're not being kicked into nothingness. They're being kicked <coughs> back. One of the important pieces of this to remember, too, is because it's millisecond by millisecond, we don't want them off for a long period of time. You know, A, it's monetizing the spectrum, but potentially for us, B, these are our witnesses. These are our 911 callers. These are our victims. These are other people we don't want into nothingness forever. We want them to be able to communicate as quickly back as they can. So we want the network making these decisions fast to not leave them off forever. And we want to be able to get information from them. Questions on that? So we all kind of have an idea of what this thing's trying to do, what the network itself looks like. Any questions on the phone, too? Did they pop up? None yet? OK. Flag me down if we have any. All right, so that gets us started with the day. I want to go through now those various different network states. Okay. Does everyone remember this picture? Yay, layer cake, most convoluted infographic ever created. Very simply, in all the crazy, up here in this block is data. It's things the network can know and things the network can learn. So over here in static, it's the basic things the network knows about you, your device, your application. You'll see that same T, it's carried. The network always knows that. The network is capable of learning new things in these other network states. This is the one box up here, you're going to see in a minute, that's incorrect in this diagram. It shows it's only happening here in local control or in control QPP. It should cross. And I'll show you how that works when it crosses across. 
Down here is your three network states. Here's your triggers, things that pull us from one state to the other. So here's network usage. When the network loads up, it'll pull us. You've got your three different first responder states. Instant severity could be something we forcibly push us. We tell the network, this is bad. Pay attention now. And it will suck us over here if necessary. And then down here, you have your secondary user states. What that secondary user might experience in each one of them. So it's complicated, but not terribly. You'll see the dynamic controller only appears in two places. It does not appear in static state. It's not having an influence because the dynamic controller learns new information. And the static state, we don't need to learn new information. So for the static state, if we're doing it right, what I don't like about this picture is that it looks like they're equals. This is more accurate. If we're doing this correct, this static state should be where we live and breathe and exist the vast majority of the time. We shouldn't need to be in the other states. The network should be fine based on what we've taught it up front. We have to teach it the right things, but it should live and breathe on that information with no problem. It's very hard to convey, but it's a massive resource that we've been given by Congress. That's big. Are there ways to load it? Yes, there are. But by and large, it's huge. Very large resource. So it should be able to make mathematic choices that keep us using those resources quite happily in the static state. Dynamic state, we we'll pop into it now, but it should be a very small portion of the time. Some people even can see it being smaller than this. And then this little blue dot down there is the control cube. We don't want to be there. We don't want to have to intervene. We want the, the mistake or the mechanics to do the things the mechanics know how to do. So I feel like strong discussion will be good here on the static state and making it right. If we're going to be living in it most of the time, it needs to be the best it can be. Okay, so we want to make sure we influence it here. A couple things about the static state. Network operating based on data it already knows. I didn't do that. <laughs> it should be able to handle network traffic for everybody that's needing it. So that means it's handling what the, the public safety folks need, what emergency management needs, what hospital folks need, what the secondary users need. Everybody gets everything they need. Everybody's able to do what they need to do most of the time. If it cannot make all those decisions, if everyone cannot have all those resources, it makes choices on who gets access to what based on, again, that data it already knows. Okay, so it's making its call there. Again, where the graphic was wrong, this is really heavily influenced by local control based on provisioning. Your agency decides to be an enterprise user of FirstNet. You subscribe all of your personnel to FirstNet. You decide what their profile should be. Let's say you choose to make everybody in your agency the highest possible priority. What's the consequence of that? Everyone's equal. There's, when, when there is someone who does truly need it, they're not going to have it because the fire, in my case, the firefighter has just as much right to that resource as the incident commander. Right. If everyone is the same, there's no granularity. The network can't choose. You didn't give it a choice. So it's going to forcibly try to get everything to everyone, and then they're all going to win or lose together. Right. So if we don't do provisioning properly within our, ourselves locally, we could negatively affect how well this works. Walk me through the kinds of choices you might be making to provision your users. What do you think is important for you to be able to tell the network about that person? Let's start with people. What do you want to tell the network about them? Is it important to know their rank? No. I got a no? 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 Anyone disagree? 
It's going to be where they fall in the incident command system, most likely. Okay. The finance, the finance chief is probably not going to need as much seniority in the system as the logistics chief that is ordering everything, or the ops chief that actually has been on the ground down there. So on a day-to-day -day basis, that person might be, let's say, a battalion chief across the board. It, you're saying it may not be important to tell the network who they are today, but it's important to tell them that they are trained and capable of being ops section chief and the incident commander. That's, yeah, and that's going to be the tricky part about it. Okay. Also, it's going to decide we have incident management teams throughout the state. At one time, I could be the liaison on which I'll need a lot, I'll need to be higher, but at other times, I'm a unit leader down here where I don't need as much, and so um, that's going to be the tricky part is defining what local control really is. Is it local control of the state that is, that's weighing that for us, or is it the folks on the ground that are weighing that for us? So the other thing to keep in mind, too, is all this discussion, all this provisioning, all of these ideas only come into play when there's congestion on the network. Because if there's not, the network will give the resources to everybody who asks for it. So it's only in that rare circumstance where double the spectrum available today is still not enough, which is going to be hard to do, are we going to need granularity on that level? Based on the description you just gave, what do you guys think about granularity by person? I think on a, to kind of, I guess, diverge a little bit. When, when you look at it. Be loud when, enough for the when you, microphones. Sorry, <laughs> when you look at a day-to-day -day response modality, and you're talking about the static network, you've got people who have the potential to be in a, a life hazard environment, and you've got the people who don't have the potential to be in that. Or you have the people that are in an immediate command and control capacity for that life hazard um, or decision-making capacity for that life hazard event. Um, and breaking those out, ultimately, I mean, you can take almost any event at its genesis, you've got, and that's where we run into the most network congestion issues, right? You get a big event and all of a sudden the responders can't talk and it's right now. And there's, there's no mechanism that I know of that local control is somehow going to solve that immediate crisis, right? So you've got those people who are identified within the community, your firefighters, your police officers, um, your uh, public safety, whatever they are, um, that are going to be in a response modality to that, that event. And when we talk about provisioning a device for that individual, um, that needs to be identified. Are they, are they in a life safety role? Are they in an immediate response capacity or not? Especially when it comes to that static thing. When we start talking about ICS teams and we start talking about incident management teams, we're talking 12 to 24 hours out. Correct. We're in an extended attack capacity where local control becomes important. But in the static network, um, I think it's critical to identify those people and then create priorities. Is this a decision maker? Is this your county manager? Is it your city manager? Um, that needs to be involved in that. Is it your emergency management folks? You know, and what priority do they have based on you know the guy going into a school to take them back at? So you in know, your that's the guy that needs the service right now, and he needs to be able to be right, right. with either decision makers or the other people there. He needs to be able to pull down a map of the school or whatever it is. There's that that initial response where we're provisioning for the static needs to focus on, in, in my opinion, needs to focus on who is in that life safety role. So even at a basic level, even at a basic level, if you could pick from two, I, are you public safety or not? Yes, I am. Are you police, fire, EMS? Yes, you have bucket one. Are you other public safety support, emergency management, utility, <coughs> hospitals, anything else that would go in the other category? Yes, you're in, you're in bucket two. So we have one gross level of priority, A over B. It's not particularly granular, but it's buckets. That concept starting it. For agencies who don't want to chase their responders, every time somebody gets a new cert, goes to a new class, they got rid of this canine, they went to that motorcycle, 
if you don't want to constantly update granular, would those two buckets be enough? Personally, I believe so. Okay. Other thoughts? What about <clears throat> bucketing people out by the type of incident they're dealing with instead of by the individuals? So hold that thought because that's dynamic. So we can't do it on provisioning. <laughs> but it's important, right? There may be a reason. Oh, it's got a hold of it. Yep. So it's the, almost there. Is the, and we do a lot with the way technology is, is this something, I know it ain't built yet, that you could do on the fly? I mean, is this something that you could do that? Always fluid. Yeah, always fluid. Troy has an emergency in his county, and we saturate that county, but it's only certain people you know, uh, that's kind of, right. and that, that kind of goes back to to what you're saying too, you know, there's... Well, and, and where my example comes from is having dealt with a lot of active shooter events, a lot of fires, a lot of mass evacuations, where you don't realize there's a problem until it's in your face. And what, when you, you know, particularly in, in an active shooter in a rural community, um, we'll take the Bailey shooting, for example, which is Bailey Cara. They have one tower. Yep. Right? And that tower was immediately wiped out with kids. Immediately wiped out. Now, no one is going to tell the deputy going into that school, hey, hold on, i gotta, I got to bump you up. Because every law enforcement agent from, yeah. you know, the six surrounding counties just swarmed and went to go get the back end. Yeah, I think I would 100% agree, and tell me if anyone disagrees, that the network needs to know that you are primary user versus secondary user at all times, instantly, without a single attribute or change. You need do nothing. You need to always have that level. Beyond that, the question becomes, to what level is granularity valued? What does it do to help your operation? And <coughs> what level of automatic? Now, to your point, everyone's got a smartphone, and when you're sitting there playing Pokemon Go, and the phone rings over the top of it, it comes to the top of your screen, that's app level priority. You didn't choose it. You didn't buy your phone and decide, now I would like phones, phone calls to be better than text, and I would like text to be better than Facebook, and I would like Facebook to be way worse than Netflix. You didn't choose that. That's policy. That's the way the phone is designed to work. That's what we're talking about. So if, if we're granular to just an A and B bucket, yeah. is bucket A big enough to handle so, the traffic that can be with all fire life safety? So that would be the discussion, right? If we feel like the spectrum can handle, if, if we just decided between A and B, it's just that bucket change gave us enough to make sure A always had what they needed and B has enough to work. Keeping in mind, if this only happens, A and B, you only ever get excited when all of C is gone. We've kicked them off. If that's sufficient, from a human perspective, the rest doesn't necessarily go. But it opens up the door to, as you were talking about, device and application level priority. Do we say in policy, this is a data network first and foremost, it will evolve over time. Let's say it does evolve. Mission critical voice is always number one. That's the number one application or use or function on the network. It always gets priority over anything else the network is doing. We can say that. We can say this app always wins. We can make that choice. We can say on the device level, take you back to the Dallas shooting, this device has the highest priority. At the local level, you might want to say this device we use for this very tactical strategic purpose. Practical, being more correct. We use it to do this function, it must win. Whereas in another community, they use that same robot for a different function. They don't use it as a lethal weapon, they use it as something else, maybe investigative or something. They don't feel it needs as high a priority. They could make a different choice. Do we feel like, maybe the way to ask the question, would you rather a high priority person be able to push through low priority data or that a low priority person could push through high priority data? The latter. The latter. Low priority person pushing high priority data is more important. Is there any instance where the flip would be more important? 
where it's really critical that the chief get through a text. It, it's possible when you've got to add your agency, you've got to talk to the yeah. 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 one, But it's probably less often, maybe less, in terms of looking at the overall number of cases, that's probably less likely. I think the important thing to remember is that this is a millisecond by millisecond decision. Yes. And it's going to take a few milliseconds for him to. So if his text got delayed by a millisecond, ain't nobody going to care. We're OK. Your chief's not OK with that. <laughs> I, I don't agree with that. It's challenging. It's a really it's hard. Activate field force unit. I, I, I don't. That's an important. It's got to go through, right? I, I don't think the data perspective of this is as critical. Millisecond by millisecond. I don't think anybody's going to know that yeah. they got bumped a second from first. I think where it comes in, and you open the conversation when you start talking about mission critical voice. I think we're talking about something completely different. And. I think you're making a big mistake at first net if you start talking about mission critical voice. Oh, I'm about it. Yeah. Okay. So that particular app, setting it aside, it would be a function of a network. That's all it would be. Are there other functions of a network that you would prioritize highly over other functions? Medical. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like what? Give me an example. Uh, if I'm pushing a strip by data, I'm pushing a strip out. I don't want my strip. Uh, the, I don't want a cardiac bleed going to the hospital bumped out by anything. Okay. I mean, it won't. It'll take more than a millisecond, but it's not like it's going to take. It's still know. a blurp. It's a blurp of data. Blurp of data. Okay. Are there any data, other functions, data hogs that we'd want to highly prioritize? And what you guys are starting to see here is, as we influence this state, it starts making really good choices and decisions. And it's making the calls. It's deciding what's going first, what's going second, and what speeds. It's that working hover, better. A data hub would be video surveillance, looking up the fire yep. on what's in front of you. Okay. So video could get in our way a little bit. Okay. Patient it's, care reporting. Patient care reporting. Most of those can still lay dormant on the on the PC itself. Twelve lead strips I have prioritized, but patient care reporting is not necessary. It can hold till it reconnects to a network somewhere. Okay. Other things that must go down. That live video stream, I think it's, it's a data hog, and, but yeah, critical to But there are situations where it's important, okay? Any other devices you can imagine wanting to be heavily prioritized? Drones. Anything that's putting out, uh, anything that we be putting out a man down signal. Okay. So on here we have the application profile. We can teach what that application is. <clears throat> what is this thing? Because you may have homegrown apps, right? You may have things that you use that no one else uses. You use it for a specific reason. So you can tell it here. Operational profile, what's going on, network configuration. Here's the user type, the default user role. There's your two buckets, potentially, to go with that well. What the network is doing. Good. That's the kind of things that we need to know to make sure this works. Just to make sure everyone understands, static state is not what's happening when nothing's happening. I kind of want everyone to really understand that. It's not what's happening when public safety is idle, sitting at the firehouse, not working. It's what's happening all the time. It's the normal state of the network. It's the steady state of the network. Today, it's what you experience all the time. Right? It's just the network doing its job. It simply isn't learning anything new. It's doing its job based on what you told it. So you will have a tremendous number of incidents, most of your incidents happening in the static state. The network will make the choice it needs to make based on what it knows. So it's not, a lot of folks have this misunderstanding that every time we have an incident, we get sucked into dynamic. And that is not true. And not true at all. The dynamic state is the network learning real-time information on top of what it already knows. So it still knows everything you taught it at provisioning. It's now simply able to learn more information and make more granular decisions if necessary. Okay? It allows the network to solve most instances of congestion just by making slightly better choices quicker. It's moving things around, I'm going to prioritize this guy up a little bit, down a little bit, give him a few more bits, a few less bits, and we're back on normal. Okay? 
It's very rarely needed, and again, heavily influenced by local control because you're teaching it things. You're teaching it, and usually the, the model of this concept is it, something like an API interface off CAD. So I'm entering in a CAD call for service with dispatcher, and the network's reading information off of that and making choices about the sector that covers that location. So for example, dispatchers, how many have I got? A couple of them here, one or two maybe? You enter in a traffic stop. Traffic stop by most officers is a medium to low priority call. It doesn't usually flag and CAD much more than that. Turns into a shooting, turns into a pursuit. You don't dump the call and re-enter a new call for pursuit. You elevate the priority of the traffic stop. That's what this would be. You elevate the priority the network recognizes an elevated priority, and if needed, the users attached to that elevated priority can have slightly more priority than they would have had normally, if needed. The only reason they would need it is if that entire thing loaded up, we pick the CLA users, and the big buckets aren't enough. So it's granularity in the future where granularity may be needed. That's kind of what this, this calls for. Does that make sense to everybody? What it's not is what's happening during every incident. We're not going to go here unless we have congestion or man down button or something that drags it into information it needs to know. It's also not a steady state. The way the concept is written, it's a bounce state. You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out of this. You get pulled into it to make a better choice, you get blown back out. 1.2 million times a second, you can be in and out of dynamic, you never know it. It's simply a way for the network to make better choices. For those of you guys who are dispatching folks, it's not like a little light comes up on the console and says, oh, we're in dynamic, start making entries. You're constantly doing your normal thing. It's constantly sending information to the network. The network only uses that information when it needs to. If nothing is happening in town and a guy hits the man down button, it'll pop it in there, but he has all the resources in the world, nothing's happening. That all makes sense. It's just very transient. Who's deciding necessarily who's attributed to an incident, though? And, gotcha. And that's kind of one of my questions on it is, say, an incident within an incident. And the, what I use all the time is where my office sits is right across the street from high school. So let's say you have an active shooter at the high school. Okay. Okay. And so now you've got network congestion, you've got parents, you've got public safety, everybody's there doing their job. Then you have somebody that's having a heart attack at the office where I'm at. And they're not attributed to that incident, but local control's taking place, and so you've blocked other users. So now you've got an issue, a life safety issue, at my office because, yeah. because that local control's been in there, but they're not a part of that incident. So how does... So local control has always been influential, but likely did not steal any resources that you would need for that. Because you didn't say by local control, incident, incident, give it all to me. All you said was, this incident is severe. This incident is located at this location, it's its name. If resources were needed and there weren't enough to make this, it might reallocate on that millisecond by millisecond basis more to people on this affiliation. It doesn't mean it would take it away from you necessarily. You're still, as a first responder, in the bucket. It's going to potentially kill a secondary user off the network to get more resources for you at worst case. But it's not going to take away. Taking away preempting amongst public safety is not envisioned here. It's not like we're going to steal from the fire department to give it to law enforcement. That's not As long as we don't allocate too many people to hire her. Right. Unless you have capacity. You have capacity to do it. And there, again, it becomes interesting conversation when that doesn't work. It's not that the network will do it. The network won't preempt you gone. The network will load up. That's a different experience. It doesn't kick you, it just goes. How many of you guys have seen the Verizon commercial with the little cartoon people? And they're all happily running across and they try to run at a door. And they all bounce off the door. Look, the door is bigger. And then they can all go through. That's the idea. If there's not enough space, get rejected. So you can get in line, open the door. That's how it kind of works. A couple other questions on this state line. Say that dynamic. This is our home. We expect these two states to be the vast majority of the experience on the network. Have we considered all of the possible data inputs the network needs to know? 
Is there anything else that we should be telling this network at provisioning or during an incident that would help it make better supportive choices for operations? Yeah? Um, I know with our next gen system, we've got 911 calls routed over cellular if it has a failover. And that's, that's a huge thing for me because we tend to lose phone lines and fiber occasionally. So that's something that I'm kind of curious how that fits into that picture. So walk me through what that would look like as a data input to the network. You want to know if it's a 911 call? You no, want to know right, right now, if, our, if we lose our 911 lines. The T1 um, line gets cut by backup. Yeah, fiber yeah. gets cut. Then all of that is routed over the 4G cellular network, over an LTE. So okay. all those calls fail over to a cell, cell mode. Okay. So, so, to, to, to me, that's network could be used as the failover. Yeah. So is VoIP included in this network? Yeah. Gotcha. So how would VoIP register on the network? From a QPP perspective? Mm -hmm. Okay. Specifically, that mode is going to be really important. That's so that device in your building is critical to you, or that device happens to sit. Could you elevate the priority of that device somehow? Okay, so that would be device type, device profile. Okay, what else? Other data. One region gave us the example of weather. We have incoming inclement. We'd like to be able to identify this is coming, if for nothing else than to prep somebody that is we're going to get hit. <coughs> Other other ideas like that potentially. Along the same line as roadway information, like when the storms coming in, the road temps, the condition of the roads, the weather, winds. So any application that captures that data would need to be important for a gathering perspective. So your storm sensors or something like that. Our roads, our roads information. We've got an application that captures uh, stills off of uh, front taking pictures forward from a snow plow. Okay. Um, and that has proved to be very influential for people wanting to go out. Do I travel? Don't I travel? <laughs> I saw the picture of the snow plow that was covered in snow. I do not travel. Right. All right. Any others? Data that we haven't somehow considered. Yes. Iowa has a condition where for a week we have a rag where I have been, where we basically have a moving city of 35,000 people moving across rural Iowa, and uh, there's no cellular bill that can match that kind of demand going across there, all law enforcement and commercial things like that. How far in advance, I mean, there's anything you could plan for a scheduled Absolutely. event? Plan, say, hey, this is coming Great. in two months, can we plan specifically for a, 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 a non-emergency event necessarily, but it for sure requires high levels of, of law enforcement preparation. Yeah, and we're going to get into that a little bit. I'm talking about planned events, but absolutely. There's ways to do that. In this particular instance, one of the challenges you have with this particular matrix is that planned event would happen in static. And the reason is because you don't generally make a planned event a CAD call. Some big cities do as a way to capture information, but not all do. And so there may not be a way, in this particular example, for the dynamic controller to learn about a non-incident. It's a huge event, but unless it knows it somehow in its incident methodology, it wouldn't pick it up. So maybe a way to identify to the network beyond just incident. Maybe it's something that's incident slash event. We tell it somehow, some way. Okay. What about a longer event? Like we all dealt with Missouri River flood. That was a month and a half, two months in duration. Yep. Very slow coming, but there were a lot of things. I know we were walking levees and finding leaks in the levees all the time. Well, that's a potential breach and going to be very major potentially coming up, but information along that line. So this has been envisioned and largely discussed in the CAD interface from dispatch. What if this was also presented to emergency management? Because emergency management would pick that up. CAD would dump it. At some point, dispatch would dump out of that call next number of weeks, and the emergency management would be tracking. <laughs> Could there be some sort of in influence by emergency management saying, hold, we're still working something. If and when the responders attached to working this, something need more 
the network would have the ability to recognize that. Okay? You, you keep mentioning a CAD interface and CAD API. Yes. Does not currently exist. Agreed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is, that's the beauty of a concept, right? It's, it's forward thinking, yeah. it's envisioned. But the other side is, um, unless unless we're looking at wholesale upgrade, it, yep. you know, we're from rural Kansas, okay. Yep. Not every CAD no. is going to be capable of that in any way, shape, or form. I am willing to put dollars down that so, all four of you states have dispatchers who don't even use CAD. We have 20 counties in the state of Kansas that don't have any type of CAD. They're still on paper, still on cards, getting it done. We 27 different CAD systems in the state. Correct. They are based together for that. Yep. The and other piece of that, is, and that's where I think it, some sort of an application on the devices, even on, on designated personnel, okay. so that they can they could log in and change that. So that you have that option if you know, if you don't want to have to purchase an entire CAD system, system to do system, that. Some way for okay. for them to log in and say there's an instant in you know, this location. The other thing I would say to that too, that's a great input that we've gotten a couple times, is hey, we don't we don't operate on CAD. We don't need to. We only have 15 officers. Why do I need a CAD system to track my 15? I don't want to have to go invest in something to influence this network. You don't have to, because you have 15 officers and a tremendous capacity you're not going to use up. Take somewhere between the neighborhood and engineering, you know, three to five hundred, three hundred to five hundred active bearers on a sector to load up a network depending on what they're doing. So three to five hundred people using broadband at the same time in the same location to load it up, ish, depending on what they're trying to accomplish. The video screws that up a lot. But you're not going to have three to five hundred responders in that rural area of Kansas to get fifteen. You do if you have a if they respond in. Last four alarm fire in downtown Manhattan is 160 firefighters. Four alarm fire, downtown Manhattan, as busy and populous as you get. 160 firefighters. I guarantee you at least probably 80 had hands on a hose, not on their phone. And there's likely multiple sectors covering them, not just one. So you get into a problem where this type of situation applies a lot more in highly dense areas with lots of people where they may have the budget ability to care to influence the network to this degree, than in the, in the rural areas where they probably don't have as many warm bodies enough to justify the expense. Because there's the response to the, when, when Greensburg was taken out with the tornado, there were 1,200 responders within the first eight hours. But what were they doing, and were they spread in a single sector? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you look at the cell tower that sits there, one sector covers because they use that tower to cover hundreds of square miles. Right. That so that's a area. great use case for this isn't adequate for public safety. But, and I'm Boomer site's not going to work for us. I'm great. The, case, the opposite case. Great. When you, when you look at urban cell density, mm -hmm. there are a ton more sectors. There's yes. a ton more coverage. There's, yes. there's the ability to remain in the static state a lot longer. In the rural environment, you've got one tower. You may only have one coverage sector. You might only have. And every single problem I've run into on incidents, real incidents, with coverage and with priority has been in a rural. Okay. Every single one. Urban environments, they have the capacity, they have the massive amount of users, they have the cell sites. When you get out into single site areas, that's where you start running into this being a major, major issue. So then for this concept, your concern would be going forward that that dynamic controller and the ability to influence it may be more important in rural areas than has been considered here. Okay? Perfect. For going forward, that's the kind of influence we're, implant we're looking for, guys. Again, it's, it's a concept. It's not real, so let's tweak it. It's considering leveraging a technology that may be cost prohibitive in the areas where it may be needed. Okay? And, and, those, and what I want to make sure that we're not discounting is those areas that have the 15 responders. Well, you, you get an incident at a high school. Okay. They could still bring the world. You've got right? 2,000 students or whatever it is, right? You're fighting there. No, you're not. Those 2,000 students, yeah. you're, in so you're in front of them. For all that you need, the full capacity if you need it. Mm -hmm. They go back to their own network. That's the way it's set up. 
So in theory, the way this has been conceptualized, you are not fighting them anymore. You're also not stealing from them, right? They still go back to the network they were already on. They're not on your band 14 anymore. Well, and that is a point that I want to make too, because just because they're not public safety or they're not a first net user, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that they don't have information that we need. Correct. And so if you have a school and you say, you know what, we have a school shooting, we're just gonna block everybody. Did you just block somebody from sharing information that you needed? And that's what we were talking about earlier. Two. Millisecond by millisecond is way different than right. shut them off for an operational period. You don't want to completely block people away from that reason, but you're also not sending them to oblivion. You're sending them home to what they have today. So, so kind of. What does it call two nine one one break? In that priority. And that's still a conversation of where is is <coughs> the way it comes through is phone calls, right? Are the priority. As opposed to the number you dialed. Yeah, the that. So that may be a conversation of can we look at granularity within the phone as a function and phone calls as a function to allow for certain phone numbers. Of course, 911 is not the only phone number used for that purpose in this country. So we'd have to work that. But there's conversations about how does that work? Do I want all phones to be prioritized the same way or can I granularize <laughs> that? Lots of different ideas. Anything else, too, on this section before we move on to the next part? Things that would drag us between A and B that we haven't considered? ABL. Why would ABL drag us to dynamic control? Well, probably not dynamic. It would be a situation, okay. incident that's going on that through dispatch, they look at the screen where the who's closest and can dispatch that individual faster than just putting a blank. Control. Yeah, kind of a different thing. Um, probably not done. Do, done via a software package, not necessarily via the network's operation. I know you're going, but yeah, kind of a different package. I think something that can drag us that we haven't touched on is, we talk local control, but when we get a federal response as well, now we're bringing in a whole lot of people that are not local to us or to any other area okay. because they reside here they move into ours, now we've upset local control completely because they're at okay. a different level. And they all show up with a mic Yes. <laughs> so at least you guys make fun at of At least a mic Y'all making fun of the feds who are here with the mic fi I checked the Wi-Fi before we started. There are 12 active Wi-Fi's in this room right now and you're all conflicting with each other. So lay off, man. <laughs> Generally speaking, the way that that is, we've been talking a lot about that with the rest of the region, because they all have the same concern. You're bringing a huge footprint into my area. So a couple things. From a nationwide network perspective, there's no such thing as your area. There's certain sectors that cover your spot, but it's not like you, yours. It's nationwide, right? It's, right. it's, it's a ubiquitous thing. So they can, in fact, come in and use that spectrum. Their phone will affiliate with that tower, just like anything else. Would it be preferable for large response teams of that type, be it big federal groupings, National Guards, um, at the state level, other, other groupings, to bring a resource with them, such as a deployable? I can <clears throat> pop additional capacity with me when I show up. Well, I, I think it depends on what, what's occurring. Okay. I guess the point I want to get to is whatever the rule is written to write local, <coughs> everybody that's a subscriber has to follow that rule. There is no other second set of rules for different entities or agencies. Doesn't matter if you're FBI, CIA, Army, Guard, doesn't matter. The rule is the rule. So in your argument, we would not want to prioritize by agency or jurisdiction. I think we got to write the rule that sets it up. Okay. However that's established, whatever that is established, but there can't yeah. be a second set of rules. You don't want to be descended upon by mutual aid in any capacity that has a different access to the network and destroys your access. Exactly. A perfect example of that is on a fire where Obama showed up to do his meet and greet. And the Secret Service showed up with their non-existent jammers and wiped out our incident. All our radio traffic was gone for eight hours. It was a disaster. It was an absolute nightmare. And they're not going to tell you, hey, 
Yeah, they're not going to tell you we did it. Yeah, we. I don't know what happened. Must be something. Check your check your transmitter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to look at Becky, and Becky has that in notes, and we're good to go because I can tell you who I can't influence. <laughs> <laughs> they don't listen to me. So we have a question from the web. <gasps> <laughs> They're here. Okay. So, uh, what about a device versus a user? Okay. Is a high priority user uh, picked from a pool of devices, or how does the user get high priority on a loaner device? Excellent. So that's what another question we've been struggling with. How many of you guys have devices for right now for your responders that are shared between responders? Most. Right. They come in, they get in the patrol car, and that's the same computer that the guy before them was using. Okay, so do they have a higher priority on that modem than the guy before them or not? Or is it based on that is a patrol car modem and that's the priority it's given? How would we do that? Why wouldn't you base it on a username or a user profile? So you could do it by what's called ICAM, right? Person. Yeah. I log and I identify, it goes through. I would rather manage it. I would rather manage it by device. Okay. Because I'm the one who has to manage it. And people move too much and they change roles. And that's just one more place that gets forgotten. So now they're in this other capacity and they were a firefighter and now they're a captain. And it got forgotten. And it won't be known until it's absolutely needed. Whereas if the device is set up that everyone who sits in that seat has the rights of a captain because that device is only available to captains because it's on okay. the Passenger side of the big red. That's the way all of our devices are too. Well, you go with the, if you go with the monitor, they're all paramedics. They're all using it. The captains in the captain's seats. Yep. Even if I, uh, even our invest internal investigators, yep. only that group uses those. Yep. Is there room in that discussion for maybe both ways? And my example would be a volunteer. They're going to bring their own device. That device is theirs. They're going to somehow affiliate, and I'm a firefighter. I'm a volunteer firefighter, but I'm a firefighter. And I, therefore, am a first responder on this network. They then move. Right there. It's still their device. They took it with them. Do we need to somehow have mechanisms on both of them for, to allow for that concept? It depends on what device you're talking about. Because if you're talking about a phone, yeah, it's their device. Any other device that may use LTE, more than likely, unless they're carrying it home with them, they're not going to be taking a $30,000 monitor. Your body cameras, your yeah. cyberscope, those types of things are all department owned issued and shared. Okay? How, how about points? The, you, you have a thousand points worth of bandwidth available at any one cell site, and there is points allocated to local control. There's 700 points that the county can, that, that region can deal with. You dealt, dealt them out on local control, so locally you know where the <coughs> are. And as a fire chief, I can get up to 10 points. And so when I'm on my device, I'm normally at a one, <laughs> but I now need to talk, hit my app, and I can bump up to the 10 points that I have available to me. Why would you ever go back down to one? Yeah. And that's why you allocate. Sure, uh, but, but, <laughs> but, but, but it can't go up to 100. And people forget. Right. But, but I can't elevate myself to 100. I'm only able to attend, but our EMA can do 50. Or maybe he has 50, he can give me 10 more. And maybe that's a really good concept to bring up here, too. This is, this is a network. Mm -hmm. it, it is mechanical. It is not going to solve all that operationally ills. We still have to be responsible human beings. And we, still have, to be and we still have to be intelligent into how we use it, much like water coming out of our faucet. Mm -hmm. Right, there's still amounts of water. You can turn that faucet all day long, but you're gonna get a Right, there's very, very different ways of looking at how do we still be human responsible with the resource we're given, and, and different ways of metering that. And, and maybe as fire chief, I've got ten points. My firemen have three points, but I can give one of the guys my ten points. Say, like, boom! I gotta give. He, he, what's he doing? Is a lot more important than what I'm. Sounds like that whole you can pay each other like yeah. friends for the Yeah. <laughs> here, here. I do that. I think to go back to your yeah, question, yeah. though, it becomes whatever agency you're affiliated with to enroll you into the system. Okay. Because there's going to be some individual enrollees, and there's going to be agencies that enroll. We have to have mechanisms. Would you guys be okay 
if there was, for example, a pick list of choices to enroll yourself as. Here's the various profiles that exist nationwide and you may pick among, or would you want to be able to customize within those? Well, I think you need a pick list, but at the same time you need a vetting system. Okay. Who are you and... and you need to be able to prove that you are who absolutely. you say you are. Okay. You to be able to prove... Credentialing matters. You, you got credentialing matters. Got it. Of some sort, some fashion, it does matter. Just and because it's fun to ask, how often should we credential somebody? I think if you, in your examples, if you move from city A to city B, now you're a permanent person in city B, that triggers a change. Now, you would have to tell me. Yeah. It's on a nationwide network. I don't know that you moved. I just know that you went. Um, uh, but the system knows you went. A similar mechanism yeah, exists, so like, when, when I've been a Verizon account administrator, is a single point of contact for Verizon for that. If I've got employees with their own devices, right, I can come in and go, okay, well, you're eligible for the city's discount, so here you go, and hit a button and it sends it off to them. They, they go to apply for that and boom, it pops up on their bill. So, I mean, those, those mechanisms exist. They all exist today. The existing yep. stuff. Is anybody else using a credentialing system within their state? I know Nebraska, they're starting to use, they're starting, now once you know it, our county doesn't do it yet because it's <laughs> yeah, we don't. logistics, but um, of credentialing, you know, public safety entities and keeping that database. I mean, if those entities are creating a database already, it would seem like that might be a database that a person could tap into because each agency, like you said, and that's why we're not doing it, is responsible for keeping track of everybody. You know, in our case, we've got 700 and some cops in Omaha, 600 and some firefighters. It's a lot. And three secretaries. Uh, so, no one wants to do that right now. The smaller counties, from my understanding, are starting to do that. And so, when they go on scene, I think the goal is, is you can go on scene, scan in, and now you kind of know where you're at as far as your capabilities go. So various, yeah, there's various different ways of getting that credential, but it's going to be important to us to identify who is in bucket A, bucket B, and bucket C, and that's going to be that mechanism. Somehow that has to be defined. How we know that you belong in the bucket that you're in. I do want to move us forward so that we don't get too far behind on traffic, only because I know y'all want to go home at some point. I want to walk you through a little bit of how your phone works today 101, as we discussed this, so that it kind of gives you a sense of what this looks like. There's a reason you call it cellular. Phones, right? Cellular technology and LTE and all these jazz. Basically, it works in sectors and cells. Okay? So each standard tower that you see has three sectors. Some now have four. There's various different ways to do it. For the, the general purposes, we'll call it three. Each different sector is bringing out the antenna, has the full bandwidth. It has, in this case, 20 megahertz of spectrum. 10 up, 10 down, 20 meg. Each one is separate from the others. If this one loads up, this one does not. Okay, so it's very different than LMR. Make sure everyone gets that. The way that you load up or that you use the capacity in the spectrum is by making various different actions, okay, doing various different things on your devices. A voice call is shown here. It takes up a chunk. You have to upload that call, you send it to the person, and they pull it back down. So if the person you're calling is standing in the same sector as you, both of those bits are coming out of that piece of spectrum. If the person you're calling is standing in the other sector, the uplink is in one, the downlink is in another. Okay, so it very much matters who's doing what where. Uploading video takes a big old chunk of bandwidth. Okay? Downloading video also takes a large amount of bandwidth. Uploading pictures, downloading pictures takes less, more than a voice call, but less than a video. Okay. Sending text messages is a blip on the radar, and it's why they tell you push a text if you can't call. Look at the difference, generally speaking, relatively speaking, of a text. It's very, very small. Okay. Receiving text message, same thing. Streaming a video. Streaming a video takes a bunch, but less than downloading it or uploading it. Okay. So tell me, is it better to stream videos or upload download videos? I like depends. Why? Because if you're streaming, you're not using as much at that for those five milliseconds as you're using it for a longer period of time. Correct. 
If you're going to be in a situation where you need to be able to grab that video, you may want to take the extra second to upload it, because then you're done. You've only taken up that spectrum for this amount of time. Whereas if you're streaming, you're taking it up for forever. Less of it, but for as long as the video is live. Okay, so it's a good thing to consider when you start talking local policy. What am I doing with my videos? My videos that are getting extremely prevalent in public safety. I'm uploading, downloading, streaming, it matters. It's a huge bandwidth hog. That's your threat to spectrum, is video. Okay. Body sensors becoming a much bigger deal. Extremely small, little bits of data. Location sensors, very small little bits of data. Web searches are dinky. Database lookups are dinky. These are hits on the network, fast and quick. And they don't take up much at all. Video calls do. They do take up a bit. Please don't FaceTime when a telephone call will do. Okay. Over the top, things like Skype are not efficient. They use up a lot more spectrum than a normal call would. They don't maybe use up as much as streaming video, but they use up quite a bit. Okay. So we don't need them unless we need them. Okay. As people come in in that sector and they're doing various different things, note that the sector's filling up the spectrum for all the various things that they're doing. The other thing you should note is what's happening to that sector. The green used to touch the black, and it no longer does. The way that cell towers work, as the resources get intense, it pulls that resource toward itself. So these folks out here on the edge of the capacity, the edge of the coverage area, they start losing resources. Have you ever looked at your phone seen full bars and can't do a thing with it? That's where you are. You're out on a cell edge. There aren't enough resources to do what you're trying to do. And so these folks are hosed right now. They don't have enough resources to try to do the resource intensive things they're looking at. There's ways for the network to deal with that though. Okay? And this is where we get into, like I said, rural is a lot of times single coverage. Many areas, it's multiple coverage. You've got multiple sectors covering a single location. How many sectors are covering us here right now? Anyone know? Tell you right now, it's three on Verizon. And at the end of this, if you want me to pull up your phones, I'll tell you how many are on yours. All that data is on your phone right now. I'll tell you how many sectors you're affiliated to at this location. Okay? So right now, this tower over here has nothing going on. So it says, that's okay, I'll pull you. And it pulls these two guys who are in its coverage print over onto itself. It's called a self optimizing network, a SON, if you've heard that. You have no idea it happened. You don't know what you're affiliating to in any given second. It's taking care of it for you. Because okay? again, each sector has full access to the full bandwidth. So if you're covered by more than one sector, you're, you're accessing two different sets of bandwidth. You're not locking up the same resources at the same time. Okay? The basic way this works Overloading one sector, as we talked about, does not have an effect on the rest of the network. If you overload an LMR, if you overload in radio, the whole town loads up. Everybody knows that when the snow plows go up, you might as well forget using your radio. It loads everywhere. This is not how LTE works. LTE works on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. So you can crash out in the sector, and the rest of the network is fine. Okay? Most of your loading happens in the air, in the RAN, and that's how it would look. If you loaded two sectors, it still doesn't impact the ones around it. And it doesn't impact the ones between it. It's very specific as to how that loading happens. There are ways for us to fix that capacity problem, especially if it's chronic. So if it's happening a lot, we see a ton of loading in one particular sector, you can bring in what are called small cells, permanently mounted additional terrestrial coverage. That's what you mentioned for metros and what they tend to do a lot of. You'll also see small cells in stadiums and places where you have big events. It provides additional sectors, additional capacity. Okay, so you can cover areas permanently that have a constant problem. If you have a sector that loads up occasionally, State Fair is a good example, perhaps doesn't load most of the year, but during State Fair it sure does, you bring in deployable coverage, you pop it up, you add capacity, enjoy the event, take it down. Okay, so that's kind of how you can work with all the different loadings but it really depends on if it's constantly loading or only occasionally loading in terms of investment and how much it takes to cover it. Everybody remember the beehive? Yay, beehive. 
this is how the beehive conceptualized an incident, right? We have a structure fire, we have two sectors covering that structure fire, and we're in loading. Is it possible? Sure. What's it more likely to look like? That. You're fighting a fire and the network is fine. The network is more than fine. Everybody has resources. The guys in the next apartment are shooting their videos and sending it to their friends, and it's fine. Everything is okay. This is not likely to overwhelm either sector. And the network's going to make its choices. It's going to live in the static state, and it's going to be okay. okay. But I want you guys to divest in your minds that instant of loading and incident are the same thing. We don't only load during incidents, public safety incidents. They are not correlated. You can very easily load when nothing's happening. You can not load during an incident, right? So let me give you an example. Let's say you got a firehouse, and I'm picking on firefighters today, and I feel bad. But they're doing a training video, and the chief tells them, everybody in the firehouse, I want you to download this training video to watch. They're at cell edge, where the firehouse happens to be, and they all go to download this HD video. It doesn't take that much. A bunch of guys downloading the video at the same time at cell edge. Absolutely, absolutely could congest that sector. Absolutely could put us into a capacity problem. What's the bigger problem with it, though? How do we undo it? How does the network address this? I already know how you're going. That's why you're going. You're Mario Brothers yeah. pointing things on and down. So here's the problem. Those are primary first responders who are on duty using a department-issued device to do a department-mandated function, and they are not on an incident or call. There is not a way on earth this network knows how to solve their problem. It's going to give them every resource they ask for, even if that means taking it away from somebody else. So what do we need to do here? Chief, get them on the Wi-Fi. It's a building. Right? Use the resources you have to yourself. Get on the Wi-Fi, just like you do at home. When you're at home, do you sit there and live on Sprint? Or do you have your Comcast, whatever Wi-Fi, and you switch over and you use the resources you have at home? Okay? Same thing. Let's use the resource we have smartly. Let's maybe not all 12 of them download it at once. Could one of them download and project? That'd be awesome. Okay? These are human choices we make. We're going to continue to have to make. It's not an unlimited resource. It's a big resource. But we still have to be human about it. So there are things that can be done on the network that we can't fix. We're going to have to make local choices. How many of you guys have wireless broadband over the air policy today about video usage in your departments? Yay, what? I'm very happy. Most people don't. Your agencies are probably doing this. You probably have no policy for it. Well, we don't, we don't want to do video over the station computers. There you go. Huh. So there's no Netflix happening. Game of Thrones. Nope. Oh. All right. You also might have congestion in this example that has nothing to do with an incident. I, I laughingly use the paparazzi today. Justin Bieber went off Instagram. Let's say Justin walks out of the donut shop. People go crazy. Everyone pulled out their cameras. They're videoing and Facebook lighting and spreading. Well, I don't know what they do. All these crazy things. Completely congesting the sector. There's no incident. There's nothing for you to mark. Can't do anything about it. You also don't care because, to your point earlier, that's the public, and we need that spectrum on a millisecond by millisecond basis. Their video does not go through. That's the difference from today. Use it to your heart is content, folks, until we need it, and then you don't get to use it anymore. It's very simply how that works. It also works the same way for planned events. Today we have massive issues with congestion, usually at football games. Um, DNC, RMC, State Fair, balloon <coughs> fest, so the one they gave us that's out in the middle of the field until there's balloons there and there's 100,000 people there. You're going to have congestion at these events, and today that's a huge problem for public safety. The reason behind this network is to eliminate that. Use it all you want until we need it and then we get it. Now, in instances where you know this is going to happen, this is a known planned event, there are some solutions proposed for it that people have considered in this concept. One is deployables. We 
we come in in advance and add capacity, small cells, and pre-replant, this is going to happen a lot, and put in terrestrial capacity. The other option is that secondary users stay restricted. We don't let them free range to all of our spectrum <coughs> all the time. We know this event is going to be intense, we only give them this much of it. And we keep that 100% for us for the duration of the event. The concept allows for many, many ways to handle plant events. It is very possible you could have that. Lots of things happening in town, loading lots of different things up in lots of different ways. What happens to the fire? So that's the LTE mindset. It's very locally dependent, very locally specific. Nothing's happening. These guys over here, they are not impacted the way that we used to be. It's a very different way of thinking about it. So looking at how this looks on that past diagram, okay? Let's say you've got folks doing things. They're moving in and out of the sector, normal day-to-day -day life, using various different applications, doing various different functions, using various different amounts of spectrum, okay? You can move through the cell sector and keep going. When you come in, you use the spectrum. When you walk out, you take your use with you. Okay, so all these different things are moving in and out. There's public safety folks in that mix, and there's commercial users. Something happens. Whatever that something might be. And now we have a flood of people coming into that sector, and they all arrive together. If they all start doing massive amounts of things on the spectrum, the network handles it great until a point. And then it's too much access, not enough resource. At which point, QPP takes over. And the secondary commercial users are preempted in one way or another, and then we kick off and we do what we need to do and have the spectrum to do it. Okay? Noticing nothing happens in those other two sectors. They still operate the same way they were. Okay. Basic questions about that. Thoughts about it. Does it make sense? Because going forward, that's what we're going to be operating off of is this concept. Is it, is it functional? Does it do what we need it to do? Does it give us enough comfort that we have the quality that we need? That we're not going to notice? And I guess that's really one other point I want to make to everybody. If this is working right, you guys never see it again. Right? It's behind the scenes. Yeah? Assuming that the state plans come back with the coverage that the states have discussed that's applicable for them, okay. so that they have the coverage, the real question is going to be is that when those cell sectors draw in, are there going to be dead spots? Because that would be the political nightmare of the process. So I think the state plans and the thoroughness of coverage is specified by the state plans when they come out really determines if that's not it. Because I don't know that it's a technical issue as that everyone feels is as much as coverage. Yeah, and at least what we're hearing from our law enforcement people is, well, if there's coverage, that's really what it is. And the drawback on cell sectors could cause loss of... So loss coverage of and coverage. capacity are still king. Yeah. If coverage and capacity reign, this becomes tertiary as yes. important. Yes. Okay? So I have a comment or two. Absolutely. So how, so did the agencies and their users self-report to a central office, a state office. How are these folks and devices vetted to qualify for their position? So how do you hierarchy? report yourself to FirstNet to get yourself QPP? The answer today as envisioned is by enterprise user or by individual user. St. Louis PD becomes a customer of FirstNet. St. Louis PD comes to FirstNet with their user base. These are who's on my account. Individual St. Louis <coughs> proximal volunteer fire department person comes to FirstNet and says, I'm a volunteer fire department. Here's the letter from my chief by themselves. So those the priority, those, so those levels of authorities within the QPP are set through a questionnaire to Metro PD. And it's really a great, it's kind of the question we're asking is what makes the most sense? Does it make the most sense to come, when you come to us, I would like to buy service for my 100 people. Does it make the most sense to you to have a, basically a account profile to fill out 
this is who our department is, here's our authorized users, they get priority one, two, three, four, check, 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 done. Or would it make better sense for you to come to us and say, here's my descriptors about all my people. I'd like to fill out an individual form for each person. What makes sense based on how valuable this is? So today you don't do that. Today you go to Verizon, and you had a great point. I log in, I say these 10 people are with me. They go to their own store, buy their own device, and it comes up, they get a discount. I, I do that, I can say I'm a federal employee. I go to the store and say, oh, look, you are, you're a federal employee. Somehow knows me and I get that discount. Tomorrow, if you want to credential them, to what extent do we do that to make sure this continues to work and we don't lose the value of it by flooding it? Now, I can tell you that that's critically important to us as well for, for an obvious reason. If you are a FirstNet uh, subscriber, you subscribe to FirstNet as a public safety entity or employee, you go across our core. If you are using Band 14 as a secondary user, a CLA user, you do not cross our core. So you're on our spectrum, but not our core. We don't bill you. We don't track you. So we want that differentiation. Our core is partly our security as well. Ours, we don't want you in here. We need to make sure that differentiation happens. Is there any best way that you guys can envision doing that? Any convenient yet effective way? Or See, well, it would seem to me like you'd have to have some kind of a mastery list, but because of the dynamics of the situation where you could have different people doing different things, it's almost like an on-the-fly verification for the incident. So like if somebody comes in and it's going to be the incident commander, they you know, typically serve that role, but they would be, that would be one of their possible roles that they could be in, there would be some way that they would validate that over the network on the fly as they go. If we needed to know that, the day-to-day, -day, if we didn't, right. their department would tell us, this guy's with me. Then be static, whatever. Okay. So the only time we need that additional piece is when we have severe congestion. Before that, are you, is it sufficient for the department to credential their own and then tell first that these guys are a part of me. I, I think there's still times when you want to move people around different roles. Okay. So I'm not sure how that would. I guess the question is, do we care about your role? If you move them around your department, do we care as long as they're still within your department? Is there value to us knowing that? Us being the network? Well, the metro, you brought on metro, so if I'm a traffic, you know, meter reader in Metro St. Louis yep. who's under the you know the PD under would be on that contract or if I'm the 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 tactical leader of the SWAT entry team there seems to be there would need to me need to be an identifier the difference on okay. the network for those two so there chamber could be fire service or whatever. So it could be value to choice. Mm -hmm. Maybe a small agency is perfectly, they're fine to say, these five guys are all equivalent to me. They're all my firefighters, they're my team. And that's enough, and I don't want to go through a lot of the paperwork. But a large agency might say, no, no, I have animal control, I have SWAT, I have detectives, I have, and they want to be able to provide additional detail. We need to be able to produce the mechanism to do both. Right, yes. agreed. Okay, good, good. Other thoughts on the happy people walking through the green wall? All right, let's talk stuff that's very operational. It looks a little more like you're familiar with, right? How many people remember the highway analogy? Yay, highways. By the way, we're still doing good on time. You're not, okay? The basic concept of the highway is that it's a big resource, a lot of people traverse it. There's many incidents that happen on it day to day that may or may not involve us, right? Lots of public safety traffic, lots of public safety traffic that's regarding citizens, some that's not. There's an intermix. All these things can happen on the basic highway. The other thing that I like about the highway analogy that another one of our regions pointed out, there's a reason in this country we have an interstate system. So that you don't get on the highway in this city and the signs are blue. And in the next city they're purple. And sometimes they're on the left side. And sometimes they're in cursive font. And sometimes you get to go 35 miles an hour and it's dirt road. And sometimes you go 75 and it's asphalt. It's standardized. Get on the interstate, it's the same experience across the country. That's kind of the idea. Local roads, 
change up. The interstate stays the same. Nationwide ubiquitous network, what does that mean to look like? Okay. Let's say we have a very simple incident. You have a pursuit. Single suspect, single officer. Give me an idea, call them out. What might this officer be doing from a broadband perspective? Transmitting video. Wee! That was the most I've ever gotten. All right, so start over here. Location data. Location data, ABL. Transmitting live video. Streaming video from a dash camera. Perfect. Streaming voice. Good. Good, so it opens up the microphone. We're just talking. Streaming voice. What else? License plate reader. License plate reader. How would that work? It would capture the license plate of the vehicle that's being pursued. And a photo, takes a picture, yeah. pops it through the MDT in the car, sends it back to a database, look up, finds it, brings the information forward. Is that car stolen? So it's, it's running wants, be, running warrants. It also might be running, if it's equipped with a license plate reader and it's a real-time database, it would be reading all the plates it's passing to. <laughs> We're getting all sorts of recordings. <laughs> Minor problem. You really got to target that. And we hope the pursuit's going nice together. They're not doing this. Or else it's a real problem. Okay. I think something that, that's evolving, I mean, I don't think it's out there everywhere, but it is evolving, is the secondary systems that are in, in vehicles now are also probably communicating or working to begin to communicate back to that squad car, i.e. Um, uh, Chevy's thing, whatever it is, OnStar. You know, yeah, ABL continues to work. So, and you might have things but, like. But OnStar um, has a capability, maybe to, and they're getting to that point. Not only can OnStar control that, that the vehicle being chased, but I would venture to guess that that police officer's car is also transmitting information on what it's doing. Back so that the to sergeant the somewhere service, that's listening. Well, back to the service, the maintenance garage. Yeah. Because we, ha we have instances, right, where, where your, your officer is saying, I, I'm in um, following closely to a failure to yield at 35 miles an hour with no other traffic. And it turns out they're in pursuit at 110 through downtown traffic, and they modify that. So we could maybe have some sort of telemetry <coughs> visible from a sergeant's desk elsewhere that shows this is what this vehicle's doing. I'm going to call this off. Um, it'd be a limited amount of data also, but just your, your CAD update. Any, yep. Any time the dispatcher updates that cat, if you have a mobile cat, that's going to be updating. Popping up on the computer all the time. Mm -hmm. What else? Body cam video. Would you want the body cam and the dash cam streaming at the same time? Some some departments have not done that. Perfect. Some are They're attached to the siren, right? Supposed to turn their body cam on as soon as they make contact. Sorry. And like, like I said, some are attached to other things. So it could be that if the siren was activated, there's a wireless signal between the two that activates the other. Heard of that? Some cars are mobile hotspots, so it's it's, a it's happily radiating spot. too as it's driving yeah. along. Okay. I mean, uh, it's already a hotspot. Telemetry on the officer. What's that officer's heart rate? What's that officer's pulse rate? How's that officer doing biologically? These types of things exist. Anything else you guys can think of in the future? All of that said, officer doing all of those things. Do we need to prioritize this officer on the network? Why? I'm sorry? That was normal traffic. There's nothing else happening. Nothing else happening. So do we need to tell the network, be careful with this person, or is the network going to be per perfectly handling this guy just fine? Probably handling him fine to one person. Furthermore, they're traveling from second to second to second to second to second. They're not loading a sector for any length of time. They're cruising through it. It doesn't really matter how much one officer is doing. They're not going to impact that network if nothing else is happening. Okay. Now, if we did have a dispatcher running this pursuit, they're likely entering all this in as they go. If they happen to have that API to the network, the data's there if it ever needed it. But the data is likely not the network is going to continue to operate. It's not going to experience the congestion it would need. And the officer hasn't said, I'm in peril. Right? They're just in pursuit. Normal thing that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Some areas. All right, change it up a little bit. Everybody has friends. If those guys are all doing the same thing, are we concerned now? Could be. Why? Number of devices. Number of 
newer devices. And towards the cell edge, they're going to take all those resources. Yeah, they're skimming five cell edges, possible. Right. But earlier you said it takes three to it takes 300 hundreds. to 500 Correct. per sector, and they're moving, and there's five of them, even if they each were doing 10 things. In a pursuit scenario, obviously they're all doing things that are automatically happening. We don't want to necessarily attack that. We want the capacity for them to do that. So there could be that same entry that we made when this officer picked up the suspect could be elevated. And it could recognize that these five officers who have now been affiliated to that pursuit have some sort of elevated stature. But in all likelihood, this is again a static state scenario. We're just going to do it fine. It's five people. And all those things they were doing, with the exception of the streaming video, were blips, hits on the network, super fast, nothing that the network had to hold. The stream is holding, and that's the one piece. I'm really, really proud of this, because it took me a long time. <laughs>
If we had this incident go down, big pass down the highway, notice that the on and off ramps are blocked. It's just us. CLA users are at us for now for this analogy. Who is the single most important responder on this incident scene? Asthma. Asthma, which guy? Uh, depends on what the spill is. It could be the person going down downfield to uh, evaluate the spill. Okay. Because if they're doing a FaceTime with equipment to evaluate what the spill is, then that's the most important person there. Okay, other ideas. Anyone else more important than that? Chief's always more important. The guy's flying to evacuate. He's at the same point. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm not giving him that. <laughs> Yeah, you're yeah. Guy. There could be very many people doing life critical things on this incident scene. It is impossible for a dispatcher to say that person is most important. Then the framework allows for something that humans would struggle mightily to do. And the most important first responder on this incident scene may not be the most important broadband user. So I elevated them for no apparent reason, because they're not a data hog. But the incident commander, who may be sitting right here in the incident command post, is. They are sucking all of the data coming out of the incident into that command post, and they are a massive downloader of data. They need resources. But we didn't elevate them, we elevated the person who's maybe got a body sensor or two on, but not otherwise using devices. Because the dispatcher who would be doing that in the API interface can't know. Can't possibly know. Okay, so we have to kind of watch ourselves again on the human element. The other thing I got pointed out, which I really liked in this example, if that incident command post is parked in the same sector, are they competing with the responders for broadband resources? What if they're not parked in the same sector? Right. It's not going to be easy. It's not something we do today. We don't pay attention to it. Uphill, upwind, upwater, up network. Get out of the sector. Don't park your data hog at the incident site. Because all you got to do is be one sector off when you're screaming. And that's something that I think is going to be important for your responders is the availability the, the ability to look at that in real time yeah. and see, especially if you're, if you're bringing out a, a deployable to cover that, do you want the deployable on top of that or do you want it out far enough to maybe you can catch another cell sector, know when you're bringing that in, hey, let's park it, park it over a block instead of right here so that we can get into another cell sector. And Tim and I were playing around with this earlier today. All of this data, like you're talking about, is available for your networks. You can pop up an app right now and see, here's my, the three towers I'm affiliated with and here's where they're located. You can see them. We don't use it. All of us have this in our smartphones. It comes with the phone. We don't use it. So we'd have to be a process of to what point is it valuable to use it. The framework calls out the idea of a local control application, right? A local control basically app where you buy, you could open it on a device and see this is the performance of the network in my area. How is that information useful? If we're going to make that app real, that application happen, what do you want to be able to know about what's on it? You need to know loading within the sector. Okay. You know, your location. Your location so relative to the sector coverage? Relative, yeah. Okay. What sector or sectors? Who should have that application? Would that be something on every smartphone type of device or certain folk or certain? Who do you want to know that? Who would be, who would you find it useful? It does Okay. Anything else you'd want that network app to tell you? Number of devices. Number of devices that are currently affiliating in a given area? Because any of them could start doing something at any time going in around me. What's my potential? I really don't want it to end up looking like the green circle with people coming up, but you yeah, know, no. there you go. <laughs> but, okay. hey, look, 52 so green just, people. I would, I would say whether, they, okay. whether they're affiliated with the incident, but also whether they intend to be affiliated with the incident. All you need to know is if they're using this, that sector. If you can figure out who they are, I suppose you could turn them on and off, but metros will tell us we have people who live over an incident site. 
they, they, they're up in their apartment doing their thing. I, I, I'm not going to know they're on duty, off duty, whatever. But I guess my point to that is, you know, some of your triggers in the in the architecture are affiliation to the incident. Okay. Well, I can tell you when I responded to the Greensburg tornado, I wasn't signed into that incident until almost three o'clock in the morning, because it. And that's where they said, well, you know, if you're self-deployed, you shouldn't self-deploy. I followed that tornado all the way up there and started doing search and rescue. Is that me doing my public safety job, or is that self-deploying? So that's where I think it would be important to have within that application the ability to go, okay, there are 20 personnel devices in here. Maybe it's just a ping to all of them respond if you're actually part of this incident. Okay. Yeah. All right, very last case. If and when we ever go into severe loading. So this is that last bit of discussion on controlled QPP, on if this goes all the way to the end where we have to have some sort of human intervention. For those of you guys who've gone through this whole thing, you've seen the layer cake, seen the beehive, seen the road, they're all good analogies and they all resonate with different folk, but they tend to be a little more complex. For those of you who are outreach people, who are going to go back to your state and try to explain what you heard today, this is the easiest analogy I can give you to take home with you to try to share with folks who don't really want to go through the complicated. Let's say that the QPP or the first step of the airline. Quality of service means your flight leaves on time, you go the right way, you land at the airport you're supposed to land at, and I've done that wrong. It's not fun. You get there on time, you get exactly what you pay for and what you expect to have happen on your trip. Priority, public safety gets their own check-in line, we get TSA pre-check, we get to board first on the plane, we get the best seats. We're pod worthy. <laughs> I want to be pod worthy someday. I walk past them longingly, never that person. <sighs> and then preemption, from the flight over sold, we don't get bumped. We don't have to volunteer to take a next seat at 11 o'clock at night in the back plane. No, we're up there, other people get bumped off. For QPP, it's real simple. You can make it very easy to explain to folks that basically that's how it works. There are such things as in-flight emergencies. They don't happen often. We know that planes do not crash all the time. It's why we can safely fly home flight without losing our minds. But they do happen. So, assuming in this analogy that all secondary users are off the plane already, that plane is only occupied by public safety, we cannot just kick others off the fall amongst ourselves at this point. Who should be making decisions to manage this congestion emergency? Right. Who do we need to work with to get this thing operational? Is it A, the pilot? So in this analogy, you hear your communications focused folk on the ground. Somebody at the incident scene who is communications oriented. Be it a commel, be it a commander, be it a dispatch, somebody. Is it air traffic control? That's the network operations center. That's your knock. Somewhere in the nation going, that sector's locked up. Okay, someone who can see what's happening to the network overall. Is it the network itself, the aircraft itself? Any of you guys pilots? I'm told as a pilot that basic SOPs, if you go into a spin, let go. The plane knows how to fly. The network, do we just go like this? If everybody stop for a minute, it'll reset. Okay, we're back in. Do we let the network fix itself? Or do you want the passenger at 3060 to take over? <laughs> Did he get his penis on <laughs> He was practically allergic to penis and no <laughs> We have a problem with local control if we give it to every passenger on the plane. Because suddenly, they all want to try to solve it. They all want to try to run into the surgery suite and get the gallbladder out. How we and hold on, you're not helping to solve the problem. Generally, if I'm told correctly by our engineers, what gets us into this state is what's called an access storm. Everybody and their uncle tries to affiliate to a site at once. And there's 15 people here who got closest to the site who are at low priority. The network, honest to God, can't see the high priority back here. It never even knows they're there. It doesn't know they're waiting. So we have to be able to clear to get in, and that's a manual thing. And basically all try to lock up together and the network can't see priority anymore. So how do we get this you know, put back together? I think we're all on pretty good consensus just by laughter vote. 
that it's, it's the pilot, air traffic control, and the aircraft working together to try to fix this. So my question to you, this local person, the pilot, tell me about her, tell me about him. What characteristics, what qualifications, who should that be? Who should we be working with locally to get this right? Someone that sees the big picture locally, has the whole picture of the whole So someone who has operational knowledge of the whole thing that's going on, okay? I think for each community that's probably probably different. Okay, so tell me about the characteristics as opposed to the position. They want operationally. Just, just what was said that they have that they see the big picture. Okay. That that they would that they can set aside the biases and say that my team may not be the most important team. Okay. I just need to get this back. Do, yeah. do they need to have so that the operation as a whole is more important than making my team happy? Yeah. There you go. Do they need to have technical knowledge? LTE technical knowledge? Think so? Okay. I mean, I, th I think they, they either need to have both, or they need to partner with somebody who has the other. Okay. So then together they can make those decisions. Because it may not be one person that has both. Okay. So the analogy I've heard from another region was it's very much like emergency management. Mm -hmm. Don't call me and tell me you need truck 52. <laughs> call me and tell me what's wrong, and let me make the resource allocation. So in theory, the pilot should be calling air traffic control saying, we have this going on and we've locked up for whatever reason, not, I need you to prioritize this chief first and this chief second and this chief third, don't even talk to that chief. And, right, right, we just need them to tell us what's happening. Is that still, a, I mean, that was their analogy. Is that a fair analogy? It's a fair analogy, but if you've got the system locked up, how are you going to do it? Yeah, so probably what it is is everybody off, everybody on. Or I'm gonna here we go. It's gonna be draconian. It's not gonna be pretty. It's gonna be between how fast can I get it back to unlock that storm. So there's ways of doing it in the system, and it has to do with, and I'm again not a technical person highly, but it's like the PLMN ID, it's the way the network sees the bank of people. It can turn all of those PLMN IDs off at once. So I'm gonna drop this entire bank, and the network's gonna go, poof, there it disappeared. They no longer even see the tower. They can't keep trying to access it. They no longer see it. And then it can reload everybody up. So there's ways to do it, but it does require a person. Now, we do that because you called and told us to. <coughs> when I have no way of knowing, when I say the network is congested, it doesn't mean no one's using it. It means it's fully in use. So let's say I drop the paramedic who's doing a traumatic amputation with a surgeon on the video call. I didn't know I dropped him. <laughs> we had to turn it out. I think with so it's a challenge, right? We have to we have to trust who we're talking to on your end because we're going to do what you tell us. What's going on? Who would you guys choose for us to interface with? Like, who's the best call? I think that there's different needs, though. I mean, you've got. I think there's very, very specific urban needs, and then I think there's very specific rural needs. And one of the, the very key points came out of the rural environment is we've got a whole bunch of single seat dispatch centers, yeah. and we don't have experts floating around. You know, we we want yeah. to see something of a regional approach for the rural environment that says, hey, there there's a rural single point of contact for you know Southwest Kansas that you can reach out to and start working on those decisions. Um, whereas an urban urban area is a totally different different deal, right? You've got multi, multiple users, you've got more condensed users, um, different yeah, experts, different network topologies to look at, um, higher higher levels of access, higher levels of bandwidth, versus my single site, you know, where I've I've got a very isolated Greensburg type incident where I need to call someone um, at two in the morning because, hey, look, I'm not the expert on this. Can you guide me through this process? So there, there's two challenges I see in that, right? So it's who do we contact if we see tremendous congestion in your network? We're watching it from a knock level, and that's not good. Something's happening there. We have a problem. Who do we contact on your end? Who would we know to call? 
be it dispatch, be it emergency management, but only if they're staff, dispatch only if they can answer, we wouldn't know the incident commander. There wouldn't be a common law. We wouldn't necessarily otherwise know. But then flipping the coin, if you call us, who do we trust? If 15 call, do we listen to all? Do we try to meet the need? How does that, how, how would you want us to manage that input too? Coming in. I, I, I think it's credentialing too. I mean, it depends on what kind of credentials you end up creating for your people. Just like I was talking on our county levels, you're talking about badging and so and so forth going into calls for accountability. Yeah. If those had some kind of credentials that you guys recognized. Okay. Um, so could something that's pre-established. Okay. You're you're operating as a carrier. Correct. So these, gov these governance issues are handled at a carrier level all the time. You already have established risk boards mm -hmm. that if that whoever is an identified risk board person can call in and do that. You guys are still the carrier. These guys are still buying a service from you. Yeah. So, so the question still, becomes, is it sufficient? Is what you're getting from carrier operations and their mode of methodology sufficient? Because if it is, it's right. It's mimicable. If it's not, do we need well, to adjust it? Well, first net is still managing the core. Correct. So the core operations state by state is still managed by you. <clears throat> so whether or not your NOC is federal or local or state or however you do your NOC interfacing, you're still responsible for the core and you're not going to let 30, 36E passenger tell you to reset your core or reset any sector in any in any array. So at some point, that's a governance, a governance issue that state and first now have to determine who's the risk board in each area. And I promise you it would be different state to state, region to region, area to area. If you have an interoperability committee that manages the statewide LMR network in a state, you guys have already answered those questions. So it's of course, it's a challenge of time. Everything we just discussed right there is a factor of time and how long it would take to get that many decision makers in play to make a decision, which is prolonged periods of time without. Most of which to say, you guys get how complicated this is. Right? This isn't the easiest thing that we can come up with. There's very difficult, that local control influence that was originally conceived of and desired so heavily brings with it a big challenge. But isn't, as this problem transpires, and you're waiting for the, whomever the decision makers are to make the phone call, isn't the network still trying to resolve itself? It's still it's trying, still, it depends still, on how big that backup it's is. It's still working it. through all of those low priority requests. Yep. So, so it's a challenge, it's, it is a matter of never wanting to be here. Right. Just Hoping, don't, working, don't, planning, desiring, don't designing, <coughs> static and dynamic to keep us away from here. This is why it, it's, it's that 10 of a percent whatever use case that everyone very much wants to talk about. We have to have a plan for it. We have to be able to prepare for that ultimate disaster ick. But it's this much because it's really not going to be clean. It's going to be a big challenge and hard to do. But I think within the credentialing process, if we identify that device or that person that has that capability or the knowledge to say, okay, that's enough, we're going to do this. It's no, it's no different than the GETS or the WET system. You know, we credential people to have access to that system. Internally, I know who those folks are, and I I manage and control those people. So that card is not assigned to an individual; it's assigned to a position, a function. Now, the web side is assigned to a device. Those devices get passed on to whoever moves into that position or function next. You know, they don't take that thing with them. So it's a training issue. From our perspective, but I think it still goes back to a credentialing issue. And so, you as the knock, if you want to know, hey, I see this issue rising, if we were to identify those devices that have the smart people assigned to them and it's in the area, there possibly is a way for the knock to reach into them and say, what's happening? So, let me ask this question then. If the network experiences that type of severe congestion, and it's possible to reset it based on looking at the original profile. 
as Queen has block A, B, C. Right. We're quite sure these are the C's. If C's are blocking us from A and B, we're just going to eliminate C, and we're going to make big choices. We're going to get this thing reworking. If that didn't necessarily need to engage locally, that could simply be observed and done remotely. This local conversation might be more along the lines of, you guys have been having a prolonged incident or something happening in your area, wildland fire, Sandy Hook shooting, something along the lines, that's a long operational period ago. What more resources do you need? Are you okay? We need capacity. We have a big structural collapse, we're gonna be here for three days, we need more. Can we support, can we crank something up, can we restrict something out? It'd be more operational support discussions, in which case it would be with your emergency management IC, COML types. It, it would be a different, different conversation. Different conversation, because I think, you know, the one that, that I focus on and look at a lot is as that worst case scenario is New Madrid earthquake. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If New Madrid hits and, and that thing actually pops the way it's supposed to and what everybody predicts and all those things. Great. We're not going to be having a conversation over congestion on one cell. Nope. Nope. Not congestion anyway. on the state. We're going to be having a conversation of congestion. Oh, we need more stuff. Okay. Now I'll go back to Parkersburg. When a tornado hit Parkersburg, yeah, it took out, I believe it was the only local cell tower in that process. Now we had fringe access, but it was at that point, it was a conversation with cell providers, and we had insulate, you know, they brought a cow out fairly quickly. I'm talking within eight to 10 hours to replace capacity. That's a much different level of engagement and conversation. Absolutely. But it also became, it, it came back to local control, though, of we restricted the amount of people coming into to respond to the area. We had enough responders. But it's like you said earlier, those responders had boards and hammers and picking up stuff in their hands. They didn't necessarily have a phone in their hand. You can go to whitelisting too. You're to list of people that I'm accessing, allowed to have access to right. this or whatever. Okay? So I, I think at that point, though, it goes back to credentialing. Credentialing with FirstNet, hey, these people are authorized to make this call. But it comes back to us as agencies of training the right person to make those calls. So from a policy input standpoint, if I take it back, make sure I'm capturing this right for an idea. We want to be able to have a short list somehow of personnel in this, in this we basically somehow lost state, we've lost something. Right. We've locked up, done it, not working. A short list of personnel who can call and we can engage with directly. The goal of it, though, is it's an internal reset. We can't, we're not going to sit there and wait for the world to tell us if we see a problem, manage the problem to the best extent possible. We have to engage the short list of folks we can engage with. And then that list gets considerably bigger as incident or event support. If you've got to prolong something, continue to work with the agencies who are, you know, whoever needs assistance, it's a much different response than something locked out. To me, to me, it makes some sense that effectively you, we are contacting a federal resource and requesting additional assistance. That that request needs to come through the county emergency management because other resources have to go through that. Yeah, because it's keep, weird that way. Keep, yeah. keep the, but keep the path the same as for other resources because if we know this is the path we have to march down for everything, we'll march down that path. If it's I have to go this way for that, and this way for that, and True. this way for that, we'll never get it right. Part of the problem with that, though, and, and to be very honest, is although we are a governmental agency, we are the czar, you purchase service. So if Jonesburg PD buys service True. through a person, I do not expect Jonesburg to go through their county to the state to their True. in person or paid. I expect them to have a customer relationship with that entity. So we can't force that looping, and I'm not sure it makes great sense to. What we have to be able to do those to support the operations of the customer within the confines and, and support of the larger incident. We don't want to support two customers and take down the incident somehow. Well, and that's where the allocation of resources takes place. Yeah, there has to be a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Whether, it's, whether it's this resource or it's paper resources. Right. Okay. 
Any other thoughts or questions on that? Thank you. As you see, it's not easy to do, but I did get a bunch of good ideas out of here. Okay? It's not the end of the conversation by any means, but it does help us get started, and it helps us to begin to start to untangle some you know, complicated tangles as we begin to pull these things through. What I would like, and we'll click through these, where is it? If everyone can copy this down, and then Tim's going to send it out, okay? The, the feedback form, like I said, it's about a 10 minute form. It's got those four big questions that I mentioned earlier in the day. What's most valuable? What do you still not get? What do you understand completely? What do you still have questions on? Under each of those four, it has big block paths, like blocks of questions. And it just says, for example, you've picked this thing that you think is the most valuable. Why? And write it in. So it is full, write your thoughts. It's not choose your own adventure. It's just big, write me and tell me why. That written input is hugely valuable to us because it lets us very concretely say, this is a great, your own words, this is the phrasing that you need to consider or what we need to look at. So if you could take those 10 minutes to give us that feedback, it doesn't need to be today. If you've got advice out right now, by all means. But if you go tonight, you ruminate, you wake up and go, uh, okay, I get that now, but now I don't really like this. By all means, please let us know and fill it out. I would ask that if you start it, you finish it, because if you try to come back to it, it doesn't work, it doesn't hold you, so you're not going to have your session back, you're going to basically be starting over, it doesn't do that very well. Um, so give it, give it a, firm, a firm 10, get through it. Um, most of the follow-up questions are not required, but those big questions that will make you select an answer. That is turning into a tremendous data source for us, and we're using it quite heavily. And it's been really, really interesting for us to read. If you have other folks who you want to go and socialize with and get their ideas, again, by all means, share their inputs with Tim. That would be fantastic if you can get back to us. They are welcome to fill this out as well if they would like. It's hard to do because they weren't here, right? So it's a little bit different, but by all means, they should do so. Any other thoughts or questions? Anything else you can do to help? Anything else to make this clearer? Anything? Will that presentation be sent to us? Yes. Yes. Okay, maybe this isn't part of the conversation, but how does encryption play into all of this? So encryption via like a, like a VPN type of situation, right. like a CGIS type of situation? I have this question. I feel like I have the answer. So basically, if you put data through a VPN tunnel, so you've got this larger, big bandwidth, and here's the VPN tunnel that's set aside for data that needs to be secured. We have no visibility into that tunnel. So what you put through there is secured all right, and we can prioritize the tunnel, but we cannot prioritize granularly within that tunnel. So if you have users passing Netflix across that tunnel, it's going to prioritize as the tunnel's level. If you've got Netflix over the top of the Siege's Warrant lookup, it doesn't know that. All the network knows is what it set the tunnel as. So I can't put the granularity in the tunnel that I can put in the rest of the network. Once you tunnel it off, the tunnel gets a priority. I can't see within it. So that is the current challenge of encryption to the LTE network. But it's a known challenge. And it's now working with how do we segment and compartmentalize and shrink the tunnel so that the tunnel itself has the granularity it needs by certain packets of data. Right now, what a department will do will encrypt a phone. It'll pass everything on that phone under the under the VPN. So, so all of your API with a cab or another application would have to be done to the application itself, not through the information passing from it. Because a cab is going to be protected by the VPN. Certainly could be. So the other parts of the network again are kind of the challenge is the how overall security profile and security picture. We don't know. Until we get the bids and the RFP and the evaluation back, we don't know how they proposed the various different security levels to make this a public safety grade secure network and what that will entail naturally without additional layers. We do know, for example, you know, it's our core. We're not sharing the core with secondary users, it's ours. 
but we are sharing the RAM. So where the security interface is going to happen, where's all that going to be protected? We don't know. But it's a, it's a fair point. Where there are secure tunnels required, how do we make sure that the priority still works properly for the secure tunnels? <coughs> Other questions on that? That's an excellent one that's come up multiple times and completely fair.